So today we're diving into distal radial fractures with the differences between Smith and Colley's fractures. We're going to dive into the differences anatomically, how they present, and of course, how they're managed in practice. So if you're ready, let's dive in. So everyone, Smith and Colley's fractures are both forms of distal radial fractures, and these fractures are incredibly common in practice. They account for 17.5% of all fractures that occur in adults, and they are three times more likely to happen in females than males. The individuals we find who are most likely to experience these injuries are young athletes who are involved in high-level, high-force traumas, and older individuals who unfortunately are more predisposed to falls and who may have risk factors such as osteoporosis, meaning their bone density is reduced and bones are more likely to break. And indeed, in clinical practice, the most common example you will see of distal radius fractures is an older adult who may have osteoporosis, who has typically fallen and reached out with their hands to break their fall, but as a result, fallen onto their outstretched hand and suffered a fracture. And of course, there is a huge link between the number of fractures that occur and the number of those patients who have osteoporosis or reduced bone density. So therefore, we're thinking about those who are over the age of 50 who are going to be more susceptible to osteoporosis. And generally, women have a higher rate of osteoporosis than men, perhaps because of hormonal changes, particularly those who have undergone the menopause and even more particularly those who have undergone early menopause before the age of 45. We also know that smoking, excessive alcohol and long-term use of corticosteroids also negatively impact bone density and therefore can increase the risk of developing osteoporosis. So with all that in mind, Collies versus Smith's fractures, what are the differences? Let's start with Collies fractures. This is the most common form of distal radial fracture and it most typically occurs when someone falls out and breaks therefore with their hands with their wrist in extension. What this leads to is what we call dorsal angulation of the distal radius. You can imagine that with falling in extension, the radius buckles dorsally, and it means that the distal fragment of the radius also moves dorsally towards the back of the hand. So here we can see an example of a Collie's fracture on x-ray, where we can see that dorsal, posterior, or backwards angulation of the distal radius, which is in keeping from the other diagram you can see on the screen, of a Collie's fracture as well. So then we have Smith's fractures. These are effectively the opposite of Collie's fractures and are less common in practice than Collie's fractures. So we said with the Collie's that a patient here falls into a position where their wrists are extended when they hit the floor. This means that the distal radius gets posteriorly or dorsally angulated. With a Smith's fracture, a patient falls onto a flexed wrist, meaning that the distal radius angulates in a volar or anterior position. Again, much less common, but worth knowing about. And in line with the image you can see on the screen, here is an x-ray of a patient who has a Smith's fracture, where hopefully you can see that anterior or volar angulation of their wrist. So how are these fractures managed in practice? Well, the first thing that will happen is the patient will go to the emergency department and will have an x-ray to see the state of the wrist, to see whether there is a Collie's fracture with dorsal angulation or a Smith's fracture with volar angulation. The team will also assess whether the fracture is stable or unstable. They will also note whether or not the fracture is extra articular or whether it includes any intra-articular components. Extra-articular, meaning that the fracture is away from the wrist joint line, or intra-articular, where there may be a distal radius fracture, where the fracture line moves into the joint space. Unstable fractures and intra-articular fractures often will require surgery because the risk of damage through a lack of healing is too high. You may well find in practice that Smith's fractures have a higher rate of instability in the fracture. So commonly, these may require surgery in the form of plating with open reduction internal fixation to ensure that we have a better uniting and healing point to allow for that risk to improve. If the fracture is considered to be stable, or if there are no intra-articular fractures seen, then the patient may well have conservative management. This means, first of all, manipulating the wrist. This happens in the emergency department where the nurse practitioner or the doctor may actually physically move the patient's wrist whilst they are awake with local anaesthetic and gas and air in order to put the wrist in a better position. 
If we can find a better position, it allows for the patient to be given a plaster of Paris, a plaster cast, in order to hold the wrist in position whilst they undergo conservative management. So within the conservative management pathway, patients may have x-rays at one week and two weeks to ensure that everything is going well and that the fracture is uniting and there hasn't been too much excessive movement. And therefore, patients may have their cast on for six weeks. At six weeks, the cast will be removed. And if there's no problems, the patient will have physiotherapy in order to rehabilitate their wrist. If there are any complications along the way, if there seem to be poor alignment of the fracture, or if there's poor healing of the fracture, it might require surgical intervention to try and get that healing more stable. So guys, I really hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please support us by smashing that like button and remember to subscribe to the channel for all our best updates. And it's important for me to say we have a tremendous wrist fractures webinar conducted by a specialist physiotherapist, specialist doctor, and a specialist orthopedic surgeon to give even more context to everything you've seen on the video today. Link for that webinar is in the description below. Otherwise, you can check us out on Instagram at Clinical Physio, and we've got loads of resources on our website, clinicalphysio.com. My name's Khalid. Thank you so much for watching. See you soon here on Clinical Physio.